huh, these gears actually work. Well, I'll be Hey, welcome back to the great one more stinking thing I'll need channel. Today, I thought we could talk about gears and more gears, courtesy of the plastic gears that came with my recent mini lathe purchase. This is a topic I get into with some trepidation for two reasons. First, there are a lot of way better videos on the subject already. And second, I'm not exactly Cosmo Spacely. I don't do this every day. But if you can pay attention, you'll find it's not that difficult. Now, if you had to rewind to hear that last sentence again, you should just stop this video right now. Specifically, the two large drive gears. I'd like to make them out of not plastic. And by that, I mean steel or aluminum or brass, whatever. Whatever I might have in my pile back there. I haven't done any digging yet, but I'd like to make them bigger, as big as I can and still fit in the gear train of the mini lathe, so as to slow down the feed rate of the machine. You may or may not recall my complaint in the infamous mini lathe video that out of the box, this gear train seemed too fast for my liking and that slower might be better. In order to bring all those pieces together for you though, I have to run the risk of insulting your intelligence by starting from the beginning. Bear with me. I'll try to make this as painless as possible for the both of us. A gear is a simple machine, I think. Wait, a machine component, perhaps? No, that's not right. That definition seems oddly certain. Look, we all know what gears are, right? They're these round, bumpy, knobby things, and they're used in pairs to transmit torque. And quite efficiently, I might add. Spur gears like this are pretty darn close to 100% efficient. 98%, maybe. What that means is, if I put 100 torques in this one, say from a car engine, the other one is going to output 98 torques again maybe to the tires only two of those torques are lost to friction or heat or cosmic rays or whatever let's say we boiled gears down to just these two wheels two round things that don't slip where they touch and can thereby transmit torque from one to the other since we lost this smooth wheel no slip technology back when the Aztecs chased the aliens away using the Egyptian pyramid lasers We've had to come up with another way to keep two wheels from slipping. I've routed out some Flintstone style prehistoric gears. You'll note the teeth are square and with any luck you'll have never seen a gear like this in real life. Outside of maybe some bad clip art. Also note that they're the same size. So our gear ratio is one to one. No torque or speed change. Just a direction change. A fun made up fact. This was likely our collective first attempt at getting two wheels to mesh without slipping. I mean it might not have been square lugs at first. Maybe it was wooden pegs or like dinosaur short ribs, but you get the idea. We have some kind of tooth, for lack of a better word, on both that mesh into each other. With teeth engaged between the two, there's now a place where one wheel can push on the other one and transmit torque. Spectacular. A setup like this probably worked great for a long time until our ancestors tried to build things like wristwatches and helicopters. But those worked funny and eventually tore themselves apart. Rule of thumb, if you build something that tears itself apart, it's a good sign you're probably not there yet. Let's have a closer look at what our gear teeth are doing. Note where the contact point is between the teeth. I'll slowly move one gear and you try to track that contact point. You see it sort of move its way up the flank of the tooth from the bottom of one tooth to the top. And more importantly, the direction of the contact force between teeth also changed. What that means, practically speaking, is the speed of our output gear isn't constant. If you drive the input gear at, say, 100 RPM, then this one will flutter around that 100, maybe going from 95 to 110 and back again as the teeth come in and out of mesh. I'm just making those numbers up, mind you, but hopefully you see we don't have a constant speed here. This has been what one might consider a gross oversimplification, just to get the point across. I ask you gearologists out there to take a deep breath and unbunch your panties. The tooth form is important, and for a lot more reasons than just constant speed or torque. I mean, notice that these gears are exactly the same size. Unlike most other things on this channel, that wasn't an accident. In this case, you can't make a different sized square tooth gear with the same profile and have the gears work. They'd jam up, bind, or probably not even mesh. If you didn't catch on by my use of the words jam and bind, well, there's a problem. And of course, you wouldn't want to make each and every gear custom when you need a gear train. All right, let's cut to the chase, mostly because I don't understand this subject myself, but instead of admitting that, let's just say that gear profile development is outside the scope of this video. Involute gears. There you have it. Hopefully that tooth form looks familiar. These are only three teeth per gear, of course. Drew these, cut them out, and plan to demonstrate what this tooth form does. But now that I'm sitting here holding these, I don't know, the fact that they look like cow udders is 
freaking me out a bit. Or that Howie Mandel glove thing. Not sure which one is worse. Instead, I'll borrow this nice animated GIF from the internet. As of 2019, anyway, the Involute is the most popular Geartooth profile. In fact, it's been trending in the top two, going on probably 100 years. Now, it's not the only one that works but it's got a lot of things going for it that makes it real popular with the kids. First, the speed is constant as teeth roll into and out of mesh. It doesn't fluctuate the way it did with the square peg gears. In particular, keep an eye on that blue arrow that shows the force direction. Notice how constant that direction is, where it's pointing from the beginning of the mesh to the end of the mesh. Second, and this one is a biggie, maybe hard to get your head around, but we'll get to in a second. The tooth profile only changes based on the number of teeth the gear itself has, not on the number of teeth the other gears it needs to mesh to has. The small gear will mesh with the large gear just as well as it'll mesh with this medium gear. It makes each gear independent in a way of the rest of the stuff you're trying to design it for. Third, involute gears have the added advantage that the center distance you mount them on isn't super sensitive. You can install them closer together or further apart and the speed and torque they transmit will still be the same. I mean, if you pull them so far apart that they don't mesh, that's a problem, as is jamming them all up into each other's personal space. But over some reasonable distance, that tolerance isn't as tight as it might be with other tooth profiles. In fact, do you remember back to Alex's pasta machine? The fact that they used the gear mesh to accommodate the thickness of the noodles. Because of that involute gear profile, it didn't really matter if the gears or the rollers were closer together or further apart, they'd still run at the same speed. Well, because the gears were the same size, but same speed, but opposite directions. Could you imagine what that pasta would look like if one of those two rollers were moving at a different speed? Now, this isn't really important, but I thought I'd take the opportunity to demonstrate what an involute is. Now, that might sound like an intimidating mathematical term, but really there's not all that much to it. And since this demo has always been a hit for me at parties, I thought I'd do it for you too. What we've got here is a square. Now, if I take a string, wrap it around this square, keep it taut, and sort of trace out the curve that that taut string generates, those curves are the involute of a square. It's the involute of this shape. If you did this with, say, a mini lathe, you'd end up with the involute of a mini lathe. In the case of gears, when they say involute, they mean the involute of a circle. So if your base shape is round and you trace the curve using a string like this, this is the gear tooth shape we've been talking about, or will be talking about. A bigger base circle will give you a slightly different curvature to that envelope, as might a smaller diameter that you start with, but mathematically the shape that you get is the same. Where on earth do I even start with? Gears are sized by their pitch and number of teeth, not their diameter. Not directly anyway, but of course those things are related. You can't buy, say, a one inch gear or a 30 millimeter gear. They're sized by how many teeth they have and how big those teeth are. Kind of like with sharks. We have two popular systems, one for a team imperial, called diametral pitch, and one for team metric, called module. And just like inch and metric screw threads, diametral pitch and module are essentially the same thing, except they don't work with each other. For the sake of clarity, we're going to stick with the module system in this video, simply because the gears I wanna make are metric. My mini lathe uses metric module one gears. If you have imperial tendencies, just think diametral pitch every time I say module. I know the mini lathe uses module one metric gears because it's molded right into the gear. M1, 80 teeth. Z is the tooth count. Just like with threads, gears need to be all the same pitch if they're going to mesh. You can't mesh a module one gear with a module two gear. Just like you can't mesh an eight DP gear with a six DP gear. No more than you can put a coarse thread nut onto a fine thread bolt. I mean, I'm sure there are some people out there with the determination to do it, but it won't be pretty. I mentioned the shape of the tooth changes based on the number of teeth a particular gear has. It's still the involute form, but it changes slightly. The less teeth you put on a gear, the more accentuated that tooth form is. Consider these two extremes. This is a small module one rack, and this is a module one gear out of the mini lathe, the smallest one I could find in the mix. It would have been nicer to show you this with a larger gear pitch, but this is the only combination of stuff I have around. Again, they're both the same pitch, so they mesh up great. And if we zoom in on the gear tooth, hopefully we can see that involute profile we've been talking about. But if you look closely on the tooth on the rack, you'll notice the sides of the teeth are straight. No involute there. 
What gives? Think of this gear rack as a round gear with infinite diameter. Like this dirty, rusty gear here is gigantic. And from our puny human perspective, this section here looks flat, looks straight. If you unwind a string from a circle of infinite diameter, you'll get a straight line. So for the rack, the gears are straight. The flanks of each tooth is still technically the involute of a circle. It's just that circle is so big that the curve it traces out is effectively a straight line. All right, I think we're starting to get some. We're looking at the extremes here, more or less. The smallest gear you can usually get is somewhere around, I don't know, 12 to 15 teeth. And the biggest gear you can get is a rack with theoretically an infinite number of teeth. And since the tooth form changes slightly for every number of teeth between the minimum and infinity, well, theoretically, each gear would need its own special cutter. On paper, a 20 tooth gear would need a different cutter than a 21 tooth gear and a 19 tooth gear. Every whole number between the minimum and infinity. It doesn't take an advanced degree in physical therapy to see that, well, that's a lot of cutters. By a lot, I mean infinite. And infinite, generally speaking, tends to be impractical. So here's the deal. We divide infinity into eight parts. This is a cutter set for module one gears, and there are eight cutters. Eight cutters will do the whole range. Every gear pitch set, imperial or metric, is eight cutters. Each one accommodates a certain range of gear teeth. Now, I just bought this set for this project. I had a couple of M1 cutters, but not the one that I needed. I thought I'd go import. The whole set was about 55, 60 bucks shipped, I think. And although I did get eight cutters for the M1 set, I'll give them that much, they didn't exactly get the order right. I didn't get a number one cutter. I got a number two, a number three, no number four, though there were nice enough to give me two number fives, six, seven, and two number eights. Fortunately, I got the number seven cutter I need for this project. The change in the involute form in a certain range of number of gear teeth is subtle enough that it can be lumped into the same cutter. Reading from left to right, it's for module one. The pressure angle is 20 degrees. That's something we're not gonna get into. It's the number two cutter, and a note on that just in a minute. But you can see its tooth range is from 14 to 16. Now the numbering here is a little bit backwards from my point of view. A 14 to 16 should be a number seven. These import cutters tend to invert the what I think is the standard number range. If we go to the number seven, the range of teeth this does is 55 to 134. And since I'm cutting 100 tooth gear, this is the one I'll use. So just be careful. If you wanna cut, say, 100 tooth gear, I think technically you want the number two and not the number seven. But my suggestion is to ignore the cutter number and just go by the tooth range that's stamped on it. And because we're lumping a lot of involute shape changes into one cutter here, each cutter is only technically correct for its first tooth count. So this cutter would be the exact involute for a 55 tooth gear. And it works fine up to about 134. Once you get to 135, the error in that tooth form is large enough to warrant the next cutter. This number eight, which I think should have been a number one, is good for anything from 135 teeth up to infinity. Meaning if you wanted to cut a straight gear rack, this is the cutter you'd use. Since we're all up close and personal, let's compare the two extremes, at least that I have here. If you need high precision gearing and each tooth form has to be perfect, you can't do it with this system. Well, unless you make a custom cutter just for that gear tooth count. Instead, you'd turn to gear hobbing. The gear hobbing generates the involute curve naturally by the way the cuts are made. Like the cutters there are straight, there's no involute form, and the gear blank moves with respect to the cutter that results in the perfect envelope for any number of gear teeth. But gear hobbing is outside the scope of this video. Now that was quite long-winded. My apologies. All of this was to say we need the right cutter for the gear we'd like to make. Well, shoot. Had I said that at the get-go, I could have saved myself 10 minutes. This is the cutter I need, and this will be mounted on a milling arbor. That will fit my milling machine and allow me to drive the cutter through the work. Now the next key to this puzzle is indexing and dividing. What I thought this video was going to be mainly about before I got into the whole gear thing. If this ends up getting the short end of the stick, maybe I'll do a follow-up video. So I have my form cutter. It'll make the correct shape. And I have a gear blank. Maybe I'm going to make it out of this. I'm not sure yet, but I think I can fit a hundred tooth gear in this diameter. My next problem is holding the blank and more importantly moving it so each cut lands in the right place to make a functioning gear. My problem now is dividing. 
There's no use in having the right cutter if I don't have a way to move my work exactly one hundredth of a division at a time. And I do mean exactly. Ninety-nine and a half gear teeth may sound close enough to a hundred, but it won't work. Trust me, I've tried. To restate the problem, I'm starting off with a blank with no teeth on it. If I had a hundred tooth blank, I wouldn't be making this video in the first place. Making the first cut is easy. I just come in on center line and I end up with my first gear tooth. But how do I reposition the work to get to my second gear tooth so it's in the place it's supposed to be? So that when I'm finished rotating all of this work, I end up exactly where I started and have a hundred teeth. In my case, a hundred teeth. But, you know, you might want 99 or 101 or 52, whatever. Cue the dividing head. This is a BS zero size dividing head. It's a semi-universal head. And I apologize for not cleaning it up before putting it out on camera here. As its name implies, it's really good for splitting heads. But to give you a better sense of what this is for, what this does, let's back up and look at simpler dividing methods. These are collet blocks. They come in square and hex, and they hold 5C collets, and the 5C collets hold your work. I also happen to have a 5C to ER32 adapter. This has a 5C tail that fits the block and an ER32 taper at the front for ER32 collets. I have more ER32 collets than I do 5C. Anyway, you've probably seen this pop up a lot on this channel. The square block can divide work into two or four parts, two or four sections. Clamped in a vise, I can cut the top of something then flip the whole block 180 degrees and cut the other side, resulting in two divisions. I can also move it or index it, as we like to say in the biz, four times, since this has four sides. So it's clamped in the vise. I take a cut, flip it 90 degrees, cut, flip 90, cut, flip, and cut. That would have turned, say, round stock into square stock. The hex block does the same exact thing, except it was born with six sides. Six is a bit more interesting than four. This can also do two divisions, as well as three divisions. By turning it every other face, I can do 120 degrees at a time and end up with something triangular. And of course, six divisions. Index to each face in the vise, and I can use this to put a hex on things. Next up is perhaps a tie between a rotary table and a spindexer. Though these are technically for two different things, there is a little bit of overlap. So far with the collet block, we've been able to make two, three, four, and six divisions. But if you need five, seven, or a hundred, they won't help you out much. The rotary table, well, it rotates. This one happens to have a 40 to 1 gear reduction and graduated scales both on the handle and on the table itself. If I wanted to make a hex with this, I'd have to move it in increments of 60 degrees. 60, then 120, then 180, and so forth. If I wanted to make a 100 tooth gear, I'd have to move it in increments of 3.6 degrees. And that's not easy to do, nor is it very accurate or very pleasant for that matter. These are mostly used for rotating work, so you can cut round features or round slots, for example. You can, of course, do some non-critical dividing. Say you need a 10-hole bolt circle, that's probably fine. But any more precision dividing than that, you'll have a hard time with one of these. You can buy a dividing plate kit for most rotary tables, so if you have one of these, already you can convert it into a dividing head but we'll get back to that in a minute the spin dexer or spin indexer now, like the collet blocks this takes 5c collets or er32 in my case and although you can use it to just spin stuff its main purpose in life is to provide easy fast indexing easy division it does that via a series of precisely spaced holes 36 holes in fact around this large diameter 360 divided by 36 is 10 degrees. So if I line up that zero, put the pin in the zero mark, I can do accurately 10 divisions at a time. 10, 20, 30, etc. So if I need to do a hex with this, I start at zero, make a cut, then go to six, make a cut, go to 12, make a cut, go to 18, etc. In addition, this has another nine holes that let you split up those major 10 degree increments into single degrees. It's a vernier scale. So if I go to zero, drop the pin in the zero mark, that's locked and I could take a cut. If I move the vernier pin to one, let that drop in, that's one degree, two degrees, three degrees, etc., until I get to 10 degrees. If I go all the way to that last pin, it will coincide with the zero degree hole on the 10 degree mark. 
So this offers 360 degree division in one degree increments, which means we can use this to divide a circle into whole number divisions of 360. Again, with the collet blocks, we had two, three, four, and six. With the spindexer now, we have two, three, four, five, six, eight, nine, 10, 12, 15, 18, 20, 24, 30, 36, 40, 45, 60, 72, 90, 120, 180, and 360. That was totally off the cuff. Hope I didn't miss any. But if you were paying attention, I didn't say 100. This can't make 100 equal divisions. I still can't make the gear with this. Hence, the dividing head. Dividing heads you can sort of think of as the love child between a rotary table and a spindexer, even though technically it would be like its grandfather. There's some sordid stuff going on with this. Just like the spindexer, it does offer a fast dividing plate. This one happens to have 24 holes instead of the 36 the spindexer had. So if we ignore all this other junk for now, with 24 holes it can do 2, 3, 4, 6, 8, 12, and 24 divisions. Can't do 5, it can't do seven, it can't do a hundred. Which brings us to the dividing plates. Hold on, let me go find the other ones that came. And here they are. You can remove the plate that's installed on the dividing head and put in one of these. Whichever one has the hole pattern you might need for the job at hand. Recall the spin indexer had 36 holes and this has 24. And 36 and 24 gave us some integer number of divisions we could do with both of those tools. Well, think of these like adding to that, expanding on those. We can put in the plate that results in the integer division that we need. Though the dividing head has one more trick up its sleeve, the connection between the dividing plate and the business end runs through a 40 to 1 ratio. And that reduction, plus these whole plates, allows a dividing head like this to do... I'm not even sure really, anywhere from two to, it's more than 360. It's probably almost 400 divisions. Moral of the story, this will have absolutely no problem at all doing the 100 divisions we need to make the 100 tooth gear for the mini lathe. And give me just a moment to prep the gear blanks, get this installed on my mill, and we'll talk about how these work or how you'd use one. I won't go too deep into it, but really it comes down to you being careful and patience. It's easy to make mistakes with one of these. Remember that big aluminum round I showed you just a few moments ago? I took it down to the local deli and had them run off a couple of pieces on their slicer. There's two blanks in there. They're mounted on a bolt. You can see the nut on that side. There's a spacer, so I get these clamped together. That is probably borderline sacrilege. Probably want to do this on some kind of an arbor, like a machined arbor. But for the mini lathe and demonstration purposes, hopefully this is good enough. Because that support is so thin and I want to stay far enough away from the chuck that I clear it with the cutter, I've brought in the tailstock, the end support. I drilled a small center on the lathe in that bolt and I think it's supported pretty well. Big picture of what's about to happen. I'll take one cut, move back out, turn this whole assembly one hundredth of a turn, take another cut, do that a hundred times until I'm all the way around. But first, crash course in dividing with one of these. Again, this isn't difficult, it's just tedious. I mean, at least for the kind of dividing we're doing. If you start doing helical tapered flutes or something like that, it gets crazy. I mentioned this head is a 40 to 1 ratio between the crank and the chuck. 40 turns of the handle makes one turn of the chuck. See if you can keep up with what I'm about to lay down. Daddy -o. We want to divide the chuck end into 100 equal spaces to make a 100 tooth gear. That means we need to divide the 40 turn hand crank by the same 100. That's it. So how on earth do we do 40 one hundredths of a turn on that hand crank? Well, think of it this way. If we had a plate with 100 holes in it, we could simply move 40 holes at a time. After all, that's what 40 one hundredths means, right? 40 out of 100. You could take a cut, move 40 holes, take another cut, move another 40 holes, and keep doing that till you're done with your dividing. But I don't have a plate with 100 holes in it. So let's change that fraction up a bit. 40 one hundredths is the same as 4 tenths. That's 4 over 10, mind you, not 0 0.4. Do not convert to decimal. You want to stay in fractions with these things. They're like fourth graders. They only understand fractions. 4 tenths, again, means move 4 holes on a 10 hole plate. Unfortunately, and you probably guessed it, I don't have a 10 hole plate. So here's what I did. Looked through my plates and found this one that has a hole pattern that's a multiple of 10. This plate has a 20 hole series on it. So I installed it on the dividing head. Now that 4 tenths we were trying to do before, in the context of this plate, becomes 8 twentieths, 8 over 20. Still the same fraction, still the same division. Well, let's say I start off in that hole, where I make my first cut, where the 20 is stamped. For the second cut, I would move one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight holes. Technically, it's eight spaces, but same thing. To do that, sort of mechanically, the crank on these heads have a spring-loaded pin. I've already set it for this 20-hole pattern, and if I start in that hole, I can take a cut, retract the pin, move eight holes, and drop it in that last hole. 
My camera lens keeps fogging up. It's raining today. I apologize if this starts to get hazy. I'm getting tired of taking it apart and wiping it. One last thing while we're here. You see these two arms? Well, they're not just for keeping track of the time. These are called sector arms, spanning the sector of a circle. They're there to help you avoid counting. Machinists a long time ago realized that counting was for suckers. So if we started up here in this hole, we took a cut, moved it eight holes, took a cut. Instead of counting another eight, you could just shift the sector arms over, having already set it to eight spaces or eight holes ahead of time. Take a cut, move again, advance the sector arms, and just keep going until you're done with the project. I haven't actually measured these, but at the risk of speaking too soon, I think they might have turned out all right. I don't think there's anything more anxiety inducing than cutting gears. You've prepped the blanks, set up your machine, done all the math, but I tell you, when you clicked into that last index mark for your final cut, let's just say if you weren't a God-fearing person till then, I chamfered them a bit and filed in a keyway, deburred and cleaned them up a little. As you can see, I pushed in the smaller gear, these mesh like this, but let's mount them on the lathe and see how they do. I got some good news and I got some bad news. Good news is the gears work great. The reduction to the lead screw now seems a lot better. Before we had a 20 tooth pinion go into an 80 tooth plastic gear, 20 to eight, that's one to four. And the same thing here, one to four, four times four is 16. We had a 16 to one gear reduction to the lead screw. Now we've got 20 to 100 and 20 to 100. That boils down to five times five is 25 to one gear reduction. They're also not as noisy as I was expecting. I don't know, the comment section from the mini lathe video got me thinking metal gears would be an absolute racket. Sounds about the same as with the plastic gears. The bad news is 100 tooth gears don't actually fit this mini lathe. I've had to remove the motor cover. That would need some kind of a notch cut in it to clear this larger gear. And the side cover is just a lost cause. This thing would have to be an extra, I don't know, an inch wider probably, 25 something millimeters. And if that weren't bad enough, I had to modify the banjo hardware. The banjo is that black metal plate that supports these two gears. This stud used to clear the 80 tooth gear, but now runs into the back of the 100 tooth gear. So for now, I kind of bodged it with an M8 screw with a reduced head and a washer stack. Although it's working well enough for demonstration's sake, I would probably make a new banjo stud and nut just so this is nice and solid but it's not really a big deal in my case. I realize this might sound a little sour grapes, but I don't plan to even have these gears in the back of the gearbox. The intention is to go CNC with this thing, and so all of this isn't even necessary. That's why I made these out of aluminum and not steel. Well, one of the reasons anyway. I realize this video is already too long as is. What I'd like to do, if you're all still with me, is do two more videos. In no particular order, I would have liked to get into making your own gear tooth cutters, not like this of course, but close enough to make functioning gears. And after that, armed with what we learned in this video, how to make your own gears at home using only the mini lathe. I mean, granted, there's one or two other accessories you'd need for the mini lathe, but the mini lathe would be the primary machine. No mill, no dividing head, that sort of thing. As bare bones as I could boil it down to, frankly. All right, I'm done tuckered out for now. This is usually the point where I'd thank you for watching, but unfortunately, that's outside the scope of this video. <laughs>